Tonight, hospitalizations from COVID are at their lowest point in the pandemic, and that is encouraging news. Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Janet Adkison. Well, this evening, we're joined by Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and later we will have Lance Fritz, Chairman and CEO of Union Pacific Railroad. Dr. Gold, once again, thanks for joining us here this evening. Now, I know our viewers are looking forward to your updates and also the opportunity to ask a few questions here in a few moments. Thank you, Janet, and thank you uh, for the opportunity to be with our audience tonight. And I, too, look forward to the questions. And uh, as we start to get into the data worldwide, I'd like to just once more uh, indicate how much our thoughts and prayers are with all of those in Eastern Europe whose lives have been touched by this tragic conflict. So with that, let's look at the data worldwide and talk about where we are tonight with COVID-19. The first graphic uh, really gives us an indication that in spite of the bump that we've seen worldwide uh, due to COVID and due to the BA2 subtype of Omicron, we're starting to see that fall. And the good news is, is that we are been in pretty good shape with falling numbers in Western Europe, falling numbers in the Scandinavian countries as well. We're still, however, seeing quite a bit of uh, case activity uh, in the Far East. And indeed, if we look at the global map, you can see that Australia, New Zealand, and now most recently uh, some of the southern horn of Africa, as well as Western Europe, parts of Scandinavia, and of course, uh, foci in Japan, uh, foci in China, uh, continue to heat up now, mostly with the uh, BA2 subtype of the uh, Omicron virus. But we'll talk a little bit more about the XE and some of the other variants that have been recently identified. But let's shift our focus now, as we always do, to what's going on uh, in the United States. And you see we've just exceeded 80 million, I'll say that again, 80 million confirmed cases, over 27,000 cases in the last 24 hours. Interestingly, while that is far better than the hundreds of thousands of cases uh, per day that we saw during the peak of the Omicron surge, We've been in that hovering stage between 25 and 30,000 now for some time, and it almost feels like a bit of a new plateau. We've got about 16,000 Americans hospitalized, which is down 28 uh, percent over the last two weeks. Uh, and indeed, uh, only about 2,400, and I say only, uh, in critical care. And uh, even though we are rapidly approaching a million confirmed deaths due to COVID-19 in the United States, we're at about 650 uh, in the last uh, 24 hours. And that's 40% down of reported deaths uh, due to COVID. And when we start to look at some of the data, uh, here's the U.S. map, of course, you can see there are areas, particularly in the mid-Atlantic states, a bit of New England, uh, some of central and northern Texas, uh, a good deal actually in Colorado and Alaska, which were light yellow and even white, uh, two and three weeks ago when we shared this map with our audience that are now starting to heat up a bit and give us concerns. And as we'll see, this is mostly due to the explosion of the BA2 subtype uh, in the United States. Again, when we look at the curve, going back to the, even the very beginning of the pandemic, you can now see that we're far better than we were at the peak of Omicron, but we are pretty much in a flattened level now and uh, remains to see whether we'll stay at that level, fall off to where we were this time last year, or whether or not we're going to see another spike in the next several weeks. Only time will tell. When we look at the numbers by state, you see in the U.S., we're at eight cases uh, per 100,000 per day. Alaska, more than three times that. Vermont, Rhode Island, Kentucky, Massachusetts, more than twice the U.S. average. And unfortunately, in many of these states, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic and in the uh, Northeast, uh, and in the Pacific Northwest to some extent, we're starting to see these numbers actually either plateau or start to go up again, which is of some concern. Uh, when we look at some of the smaller rural communities, again, uh, when we look at Kentucky, uh, you can see uh, in Wayne uh, uh, or in Clinton, Kentucky, uh, or in the Nome census area in Alaska, uh, we are... Uh, still well above the U.S. average of eight cases per 100,000 per day, making the point that our rural farming and ranching communities have really not gotten down to this levels that we've seen in some of the larger urban communities, 
Some of this is just due to the numbers, but it makes the point that COVID has not left rural America uh, in a benign, passive way at all. And we're still watching large outbreaks, even in small communities. If you look at the progression over time, you see that we're now predominantly in the Omicron BA2 subtype, uh, moved almost completely away from BA1. Indeed, the BA2 subtype, which uh, far lagged behind the BA2 outbreaks in Europe, uh, in uh, Asia, uh, have now become responsible for about 55 to 60 percent of all of the new cases that are being sequenced in the United States. And of course, as our audience may remember, the sequencing data lags by about 14 days just because it takes time to get through the labs. And so we're probably closer to 75 or 80 percent BA2 subtype uh, in the U.S. Other parts of the country, however, if you look at the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic, uh, are well over that. The uh, Northeast is now about 70 percent uh, BA2 subtype, which, you know, is more transmissible and unfortunately is at least as severe, if not somewhat more severe. But there's really very few parts of the country other than the Great Plains uh, that are less than half uh, BA2. And I'm guessing uh, by the time we're together again next week, we're going to be predominantly uh, BA2 subtype uh, across the whole uh, nation. We can go on and look at some more of the details uh, of this. Uh, uh, this is a reminder that the Omicron variant is far more transmissible. Uh, it's at least four to six times more transmissible than the original variant uh, that we identified over two years ago. Indeed, the R value uh, for the Omicron subtypes, both BA1 and BA2, are somewhere around 10 to probably as high as 15. But <clears throat> more importantly than that for this audience is not only is Omicron more transmissible, but it's got about a 40-fold higher resistance to antibodies. So as a result of that, we're seeing more vaccine breakthrough and we're seeing more reinfection uh, due to the Omicron uh, subtype. If we look at hospitalization in the U.S., you see we've come down and indeed we are not plateaued in hospitalization. And I think we are doing a better job, not only due to vaccines, but due to oral uh, and IV antivirals and so many other precautions that we've taken. We are keeping people out of the intensive care units and we are keeping people out of hospital a better job. Remains to be seen, you know, the U.S. average is now five per 100,000 or just under 16,000 hospitalizations. Delaware, West Virginia, twice the U.S. average. Washington, D.C., Maine and North Carolina, almost twice the U.S. average. So there's still a good deal of variability. And if I were to show you the same graphic for our rural communities, you would see some small rural communities with much higher hospitalization rates in their critical access hospitals, just making the point that our ranching and farming communities are still seeing much of the brunt uh, of this COVID outbreak. When we look at U.S. hospitalizations, we are far lower than we were previously. And again, uh, our goal in all of this has been to keep people out of hospital, off ventilators, and of course, get them back to their jobs, get them back to their families, get them back to their schools. And so from that perspective, uh, the U.S. map is looking uh, quite favorable. This is a look at deaths per day. And as you see, uh, while we are lower than the amount of deaths per day, uh, this is per 100,000 per day in the seven-day uh, rolling average, uh, we're still not where we were uh, a year ago, you know, May and June of last year. And hopefully that number will continue to fall. As we know, the case fatality rate, the death rate, is a lagging indicator following all of the events uh, of hospitalization. If we look at deaths by, per state, you see the U.S. Uh, has an average uh, per 100,000 of uh, two-tenths of 1% or 648 is the last 24-hour uh, number, seven-day running average. But Kansas, West Virginia... Arizona, Kentucky, uh, even our state here in Nebraska uh, has seen a bit of an uptick recently. And again, some of this is a lagging indicator. And as we'll see in just a few minutes, much of this is still in those over 65 and those with multiple medical uh, comorbidities. This is a chart that I keep a very close eye on. And this is the U.S. death rate 
since January 1st of this year, so it shows the impact of the Omicron spike, but this is broken out by age. The dotted line that you see here, that's the average case fatality rates per 100,000 per day in the United States, up to and including over this last weekend. But what you see in the very top curve is those individuals over 65. Uh, if you see the curve that's just beneath that, that's the 55 to 65-year-old age group. So as you see, even though we've come to a time where our hospitalization rates and case fatality rates are still down, for those that are most vulnerable, those over 65 and those with medical comorbidities, there's still a significant hospitalization rate and a significant case fatality rate, which gets us to the discussion we're going to have in a few minutes about boosting vaccines and other such things and what the timing of that needs to be, uh, etc. You know, I, I follow this graphic very carefully as well because this shows uh, us, shows me, that the vaccines uh, are effective. They produce a threefold benefit of getting infected with COVID, but they still produce, in spite of all of the data about the effects wearing off and the need for boosters and things of that nature, that there's still at least a tenfold benefit of preventing hospitalization and death. And so again, solid scientific evidence that these vaccines are keeping folks out of hospital, particularly the older and the most vulnerable uh, individuals. Moving on to our next graphic uh, gives us an opportunity uh, to uh, look at some very recent data that was just published over the weekend. And it looked at the relationship between COVID hospitalization, diabetes, and death and case fatality, as we call it. And without boring you with all of the details, what this graphic shows, that if you take into account the individual's age, what their kidney function is, and several other factors, whether or not they had heart disease, whether or not they've had any vascular or blood vessel disease, uh, you're looking at aggregated fatality rates of approximately one out of four individuals. And this is uh, in independent of whether or not they have insulin-dependent adult-onset diabetes, oral medication-dependent diabetes, or whether they have juvenile diabetes when they're entered into the hospital. And so there's something about that combination of diabetes uh, and COVID that is bad news for hospitalization and is bad news for case fatality rates. And so while we start to learn more and more about this, what it means to me is we've got to be extra careful with our outpatient population who have diabetes, who for one reason or another either have a vaccine breakthrough and get infected or get reinfected with COVID. We've got to be super careful about the use of these oral agents to be sure that we can prevent that hospitalization as quickly uh, as possible. Finally, let's talk a little bit about vaccines. Uh, we continue to see more and more information about vaccines. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration has now uh, approved the use of a second boost for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. There are several others that are under review now, the Sanofi on the uh, Novavax products, which are pure protein construct vaccines. Hopefully there'll be information about that. 77% uh, of the U.S. population has had some vaccine. 66% has had their total first sequence, either two of the mRNA vaccines or one of the J&J &J vaccines. But we're still under 30% boosted. And that's what we really need to be focused on now, because for those that are, quote, fully vaxxed but not up to date or boosted, this is really the time, particularly for those of you that are over 50 years of age, which is what the Food and Drug Administration uh, just, uh, uh, just approved. You know, this is a look at vaccine administration per day. And what you see is we're at about 250,000 doses per day. You know, think about it. A year ago, we were at about... Uh, three million, three and a half million doses uh, per day. And most of those 250,000 per day right now are actually boosts of people who are older or people that have multiple uh, comorbidities. This is a look at our U.S. map uh, showing us state by state where the vaccine rates are the highest in the country. Again, because of vaccine breakthrough, not necessarily good news, even if we've been fully vaxxed. If you look at it by state, you see the highest vaccine rates uh, are, are 
uh, for fully vaxxed are in Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, Connecticut, and Massachusetts. But what you also see compared to the 29% U.S. average that Rhode Island, Vermont, Maine, Connecticut, and Massachusetts are significantly higher uh, for those that have actually gotten a booster. And I'm going to guess that when the second boost comes out and becomes more prominent, we're going to see more in those states as well. So, Janet, why don't we stop at this point? Uh, uh, we can talk about long haul later uh, in the show. And I'd love to uh, answer your questions and the questions from our audience. And very soon, uh, welcome our guest, uh, Lance Fritz. Well, you just mentioned, of course, the shots and the numbers of folks that have had the shots are getting the booster. What needs to be done to ensure that folks are getting the booster shots that they need? Janet, unfortunately, I'm having some technical difficulties in hearing you, and I don't quite know why. Well, I tell you what, with that, why don't we take a quick break, and then we'll just come back. We'll let you rest your voice for just a moment. So stay with us. We'll be back with more Rural Health Matters in just a moment on RFD TV. And welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Janet Atkinson here with us, and we continue our conversation here with Dr. Gold and later Lance Fritz joining us with Union Pacific. Uh, Dr. Gold, what do we need to do to ensure that people are getting the booster shots that they need? Well, I think the most important thing is for folks to be in close contact with their health care professionals, uh, whoever they trust as their primary care or uh, in the clinics that they see, uh, or even their local pharmacists, to have a pretty good idea of when they become eligible for their boost. So just to play back the tape a little bit uh, from the recent recommendations from the Food and Drug Administration uh, and the uh, Advisory Council on Immunologic Practices, the uh, ACIP, uh, what they said was that anybody that has been uh, boosted more than five months ago who is over the age of 50... Uh, is eligible for another boost. And in addition to that, anybody that has what we would call a significant comorbidity, so again, because coming back to our earlier discussion, diabetes, heart disease, uh, people that have asthma, uh, people that have uh, even long-haul symptoms after an initial bout of COVID, uh, they should uh, be eligible for a boost. You know, one of the questions, Janet, we get asked all the time is what if I got COVID as a result of the recent Omicron breakthrough, uh, do I still need a boost? And the answer to the question is, speak to your local healthcare professional in terms of the timing, but the current recommendations, and I would certainly strongly agree with this, if you're in that over 50 years age group or you have one of these comorbidities, absolutely, you need a boost. Well, as we promised, we have another gentleman joining us here this evening. We are welcoming now Lance Fritz. He's chairman, president, and chief executive officer with Union Pacific Railroad. Now, Lance, UP is one of America's leading transportation companies covering 23 states across the western two-thirds of the United States. Uh, certainly, you have a footprint across the country, so thank you very much for taking the time to join us uh, in this conversation on COVID-19. Thank you for hosting me, Janet. It's a real pleasure here to be with my good friend, Dr. Gold. Well, I know you guys have a, a great working relationship. Now, Lance, I understand that uh, you had a question that you were actually going to ask. Uh, Dr. Gold just went over the latest numbers, but you told us that you wanted to ask a, a question of, of course, it's one of the most that many of us are wondering about. At what point does the pandemic actually become an endemic? And what does that look like in this case? That's exactly right. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think there's a single answer to that question, Lance. And I think it's one, it's going to be very community specific. Uh, but I would say when our health care systems and when our support systems, including the railroads, the schools, our churches, et cetera, our supermarkets, pharmacies, et cetera, can get back to have a workforce that's pretty, pretty normal to them. And right now, unfortunately, in most of the United States, we are still struggling a bit for that. Mm -hmm. So while, you know, if we look at just look at us here in Nebraska for a minute, because it's an area that I know really well, our caseload is really down. Our hospitalization rates are really down. Our case fatality rates have fallen tremendously. However, uh, you know, we're still down hundreds of employees in the med center. I know you're struggling uh, mm -hmm. with workforce, and I'm sure we'll unpack that. 
a bit more uh, in a few minutes. And so uh, we are moving ahead uh, and trying to get back to the endemic level. I also think, you know, our audience has asked many times, asked me, about what about these new so-called super variants uh, that are being identified in the Far East uh, right now, the so-called XE variant. I'm sure someone in our audience will ask about that tonight and several other variants. We don't really know what that's going to mean. And so we, until we get in a balance of having a very adequate supply of these oral antivirals, you know, right now people get a flu diagnosis. If they want to go to the pharmacy and get a prescription for Tamiflu, no problem. Mm -hmm. We don't have that same capabilities just yet for COVID. So I would say we're getting closer, and let's keep our fingers crossed that we're not going to deal with another spike uh, like Omicron. But I think with each spike, as tragic as it may be, with each surge, we're getting better and better at handling it. Now, Lance, on that point, is Union Pacific still treating COVID-19 as a special circumstance, or has it become more of a fact of life that you just kind of have to deal with right now? Yeah, so for us, uh, we continue to treat it, as Dr. Gold mentioned, uh, as an impact on both our workforce and, to a degree, the markets that we serve. Although, I would say that we are um, much less impacted today than we were at the peak of Omicron. I'd also point out that uh, we've spent a fair amount of time getting our workforce vaccinated. Uh, they're at about 76 or 77 percent fully vaccinated, so maybe 10 percentage points above the nation, what we saw Dr. Gold share. And I believe that helped us navigate Omicron a little better than the communities that we serve. Uh, we saw a spike in Omicron, but it was lower than the spike we saw uh, in the middle of last year or at the beginning of last year. So that feels like um, we're navigating it. Uh, Caseloads down, our quarantine presumed positives are down, uh, but it's not zero. And I'm just looking forward to the time where we treat it like it's the flu. Union Pacific, I understand, of course, a very high percentage of employees voluntarily got the vaccination. How did UP and its employees achieve this? And do you believe that it's helped in that sense? And was it a, a battle or was it something that just kind of came naturally for the organization? Well, we were mandated to have um, a uh, vaccine and uh, because we're a federal contractor, there were several vaccine mandates that came out in the fall of last year uh, through executive order. And uh, one of them captured federal contractors, which we are a federal contractor, so it applied to us. And in our reading of all of the different uh, executive order mandates, it looked like the one that was most applicable. So starting in early October, we were encouraging our employees to get vaccinated because of that mandate. And they stepped up to the plate. You know, we have fiercely independent employees that they're, they are what makes our company great. They, they know how to work on their own. They know how to, how to work without supervision. Uh, but that also means they question when something like that mandate comes down. We did a lot of education. We helped them understand the need and why. And uh, as I pointed out, 76 or 77 percent of our population uh, has stepped up to the plate and become vaccinated. Now, that, that mandate in the, in the interim has been litigated, and it's not being uh, fully implemented just yet. The, it hasn't worked its way through the courts. But we're still continuing to help educate our employee base on why vaccination, why all of the special safety protocols to keep them safe both at work and in the communities where they live and to keep their loved ones safe. Uh, and I think it's had an impact. I, I see it again in our experience with Omicron, where the United States had a significant spike. You saw it in the data. And our spike at work was uh, a bit less than the previous spike had been. So I think, I think there was an impact. Now, gentlemen, our phone lines are open. If you happen to uh, have a question or a comment for our guests, 877-731-6733 is the number to call. And with that, we have Scott on the line with us. He is from Virginia. Scott, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Uh, yes, regarding the fourth wave that the news seems to be talking about that should be occurring, I was wondering if Dr. Gold believes that that's going to occur either around the Easter holiday weekend or possibly, you know, when the weather starts getting cold again after summer. And if it's more around the Easter weekend, 
uh, what precautions should probably be taken to make sure that, you know, it doesn't get spread around too much? Well, I think those are two really, really good questions, Scott. Uh, first of all, uh, the timing of a future spike is going to depend largely on whether or not this BA2 subtype turns out to be a significant factor or whether this XE subtype turns out to be a significant factor uh, in the United States. If it does, we're probably going to continue to see cases rise and uh, right through the Easter weekend uh, and beyond. If it doesn't, if our, either our vaccine or the uh, Omicron BA1 infection rates can hold off the infection rates due to these other subtypes, then the epidemiologists are predicting a surge sometime late summer, early fall. Now, why is that the case? Well, one, the weather's going to get colder. People are going to be spending more time indoors in closer gatherings. Two, back to school and other, uh, you know, associated school athletic events, concerts, and things of that nature. And three, and very importantly, that unless people really uh, develop a, a passion to get that additional boost between now and then, what we're going to be seeing is vaccine efficacy rates, VERs as they're called, down in the 25 to 35 percent range. And a 25 to 35 percent vaccine effectiveness rate is not going to stop the transmission. And regrettably, it's not going to stop hospitalization in older people and people with comorbidities. Uh, and unfortunately, all of that is going to seem to come together when we're talking about back to school uh, in the late summer our early fall. And so uh, I think it's very appropriate that the FDA has uh, shared uh, that uh, access to another boost is a good thing to do. Now, in terms of your question about how to prevent issues associated with family holiday gatherings, you know, it's very similar to what we've been saying for a very long time is, first of all, if you're ill or you think you're ill, get tested. Uh, if you think you're fine, but you're going to be with folks that are older, have medical problems, get one of these home test kits and, uh, you know, run a test yourself and make sure that you and your family members are all negative. You know, it's a simple swab, <clears throat> highly accurate, highly sensitive. And then finally, you know, uh, when you're with other people in public spaces who you don't know, you know, I still wear my mask, frankly. Uh, you know, I know that uh, there's a lot of concern and discussion about the timing of public transportation, and whether or not we still need a mask mandate, et cetera. You know, and I, I still travel the country a great deal, and I do it almost every week for business-related reasons or family-related reasons. I still feel more comfortable when I'm in an airport or on a plane uh, and, uh, and, and wear my mask. And I will un until we start to see these numbers really come down and stay down for a sustained period of time. And Scott from Virginia, thank you for your call. Now we go to the Show Me State. We have Robert from Missouri on the line with us. Robert, go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, yes, my question concerns the uh, safety of the vaccines. With the FDA approving many drugs that you see advertised on TV that cause cancer, stroke, blindness, kidney failure, heart failure, et cetera, uh, how do we know that these vaccines aren't uh, containing the same type of things that are in those uh, those drugs and that the FDA give the, those uh, approvals to the vaccines that have harmful effects like these uh, drugs that you see on any commercial uh, for the drugs on TV? How do you know that they're uh, uh, safe? Yeah, Robert, thank you so much for your question. It's a question that we get asked and that I get asked uh, actually uh, quite often. And uh, the answer is that there's no medication and there's no vaccine for that matter that is 100% safe. Uh, we know that there are short-term what we call vaccine reactions, soreness of your arm, uh, perhaps some headache, a uh, little bit of loss of sleep, and things of that nature as well. There also are a very, very small number meaning uh, single digits in a million of people that will have a more significant reaction to the vaccines. And those typically are people that have a lot of different allergies, particularly to other types of vaccines. However, 
These vaccines have been administered to over 250 million Americans with now a track record that's approaching a year and a half. You know, you think about it, the first approvals of these vaccines for widespread use were in early December uh, of, you know, a year and a half ago now, uh, more than that, uh, actually. And so if you think about it, of all the drugs that are sold in the United States uh, today, the new ones, the ones that have been around for a long time, those that have had over 200 million uses, where we are tracking every single potential complication of the vaccine, uh, these have got to be among the very safest vaccines and among the most effective vaccines that we've ever seen. Indeed, you know, the, the garden variety influenza vaccine uh, in a good year runs between 50 and 65 percent effective. When these vaccines first came out, they were 90 percent, 92, 95 percent effective. I mean, we haven't seen that kind of efficacy for a common influenza, you know, in decades. So a lot has been learned about how to build new vaccines that are both safe and effective. And so, uh, you know, I guess it all comes down to what I call the juice squeeze ratio. You know, what's the benefit of getting vaxxed and what's the risk? The rate, the fake case fatality rates of COVID exceed by thousands and thousands, by tens of thousands, possibly depending on your age, by more than 100,000 fold the safety benefit of, of getting the vaccines. So if you want to roll the dice, roll the dice on getting vaxxed. All right. And Robert, thank you very much for your call. That was Robert from Missouri. Lance, let's bring you back into the conversation here. What are maybe some other crucial points or steps that you guys have taken that maybe helped you get to where you're able to manage the pandemic as far as the company goes? Well, it all starts, uh, Janet, with having a trust relationship with your employees. And so that's built over a very long period of time. Uh, from that we started sharing information as we found it out, as we knew it, and enrolling help in our local communities. Uh, individuals like Dr. Gold and his team uh, who could teach us what was going on real time and how best to protect our employees. And then we made that protection broadly and widely available uh, and obvious. So for instance, uh, any of the touch surfaces in our buildings, we wrapped either with copper or with uh, uh, biometric material that killed germs on contact. We made face masks widely available. Uh, we made hand sanitizers widely available. We put markers on the floors of things like our elevators and queuing areas so that people could know what social distance, what physical distance looked like. And all the while, we, we've been blessed by having a, a team uh, on staff a, a, with a chief medical officer and occupational health nurses who look after the, the normal uh, needs of our workforce. And in this environment, they could, they could be uh, deployed specifically on COVID. So all that's to say that uh, I think we've done a hell of a job mm -hmm. uh, uh, getting our, our team vaccinated, getting them to change their behaviors. And, and even in that context, we're, we're all kind of tired, right? It's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a slug, it's been a real, a real uh, ordeal, if you will, over the last couple of years. Absolutely. Now, this is something that we ask of almost every guest. What are maybe some lessons that you learned during the pandemic that you think you will keep doing going forward? Are there some things that Union Pacific used to do that maybe you realized you might be better without or maybe at least relaxing from? Yeah, 100%, Janet. Uh, there's a couple of things that we learned uh, early on, and that is we were able to very agilely switch to a work from home environment for the vast majority of our office environment. Now, we've got something like 30 to 35,000 employees and the vast majority, 85% of them, don't have an option to work from home. They're engaged in executing the work that our customers need to have done. But the remainder who could work from home, we enabled that very quickly and we found out we could be, we could be effective. Now, We've also, prior to the pandemic, changed our policy of how much work from home we would allow our employees to do. And we'll allow up to about half time. Uh, the reason why we want our employees to be together is that we're convinced that being able to build real relationship, trust, the cultural impacts, mentorship, the apprenticeship impacts of work, uh, that happens person to person. Being able to walk through and navigate conflict uh, happens live in, in 
with each other. And those are hard things to navigate uh, remotely. So we've learned we can do that. The other thing that we did was we started getting the senior staff together very early on in COVID. This was, call it March of 2020, uh, daily to make policy decisions that needed to be made real time. And we knocked that off after about three months to something less frequent. But still today, we have uh, Monday get-togethers that are part of our old habits, but we've thrown in a Thursday touch base for the senior staff so that we can all stay connected and, and navigate what's going on real time. Uh, it doesn't take long, but it keeps us very well connected and on the same page. Uh, the last thing that, that I would say we're, we learned and are, are carrying forward is just the, the, the order of magnitude increase in transparent communication with our workforce. We thought we were doing a fair job prior to the pandemic. And through the pandemic, we learned that we could really amp that up, and we have and that's a habit that we've carried forward, and our employees really appreciate it. All right. Well, we are going to continue this conversation. Before we head to break, remember our phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. More Rural Health Matters after this. And welcome back once again to Rural Health Matters. Joining us is Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Lance Fritz, who's Chairman and President and CEO of Union Pacific Railroad. Again, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Now, our phone lines are open. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. With that, we have Alan on the line with us. He is from Iowa. Alan, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Thank you. Yeah, my question is, why don't we have uh, as much focus on um, the remedies once you get COVID as we do have on getting back vaccinated? Dr. Gold? Well, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you for calling in, Alan. And, you know, the good news is, is we actually do have an incredible focus on uh, antiviral agents. You may remember that early on, uh, even in our medical center, we led the first trial on remdesivir, uh, which is a, a drug that's been used effectively uh, to combat and reduce inpatient uh, case fatality rates uh, for patients uh, who are admitted, particularly older patients uh, with COVID. But these new uh, antiviral agents, the oral ones, are incredibly effective. You know, Alan, just as uh, recently as this morning, I was on a conference call with a friend of mine from Washington, D.C., uh, who we collaborate with in the federal government. And he was telling me that in spite of being fully vaxxed uh, with a booster, uh, that he got COVID. And he was really, really sick. He was short of breath. He was wheezing. He had a high fever. Uh, and this was in the first couple of days, clearly due to the BA2 subtype. And this is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I would say he's in his mid-50s, so, uh, you know, my, by my category, a young guy. And a uh, <clears throat> physician wrote him a prescription for one of these new uh, uh, antivirals, uh, Paxlovid, it's called. Uh, and within 12 hours, he was feeling better. Within 24 hours, he was feeling almost normal. Now, those were symptoms that previously would have driven him to the emergency room, if not into the hospital. Mm. And so there is no question, Alan, that these new oral and intravenous antiviral agents, the monoclonal antibodies, et cetera, are extremely effective. And that's why that I'm so optimistic that even if we see another surge due to some of these subtypes that are being identified in the far eastern part uh, of the world, that we can still control hospitalization and case fatality rates in the U.S. because of access to these drugs. I think it's really good news. And by the way, it's a testament to the quality of our pharmaceutical industry and the ability to discover, develop, and manufacture at scale new drugs. I mean, you think about it, typically drug development is a 10-year cycle in, in this part of the world, as it is in Western Europe, uh, et cetera. Uh, we've been able to do this in a year uh, and get up with very safe, very effective oral compounds. Well, Alan, thank you for your call again. That was Alan on the line with us there. And as we continue on this evening, the phone lines are open, 877-731-6733. Now, Lance, of course, throughout the pandemic, we've heard a lot about supply chain congestion. Uh, how has that affected you guys, and what role does Union Pacific play in maybe working to find solutions? 
Yeah, Janet, so Union Pacific typically is in the middle miles of most supply chains, and we touch a lot of the economy. We ship about 40% of all inner city traffic uh, by tonnage, and, and it touches virtually everything in the goods economy. So in that middle mile, uh, we've struggled a bit with crew availability. I was mentioning to Dr. Gold uh, uh, this evening that at, at peak, we could have had hundreds, 800, 900 employees not available, either because they were COVID positive or presumed positive and had to quarantine. That's down to maybe 75, 80, 85, 90 right now. So it's fundamentally different. But when, there, when your workforce isn't available, of course, that has a significant impact on your ability to do the work that your customers need done. That carried over into the trucking community, and they had a double whammy. When, when non-essential industry was shut down in the early days of COVID, it shut down truck driving schools. And hence, they weren't producing the, the labor force that they needed, and they got way behind. So truck seats are still going empty, and uh, that's a real problem in, in virtually every supply chain in the United States. Then we also have periodically the, the source of product in Asia, whether it's in China or other Asian countries, that are periodically going through shutdowns of their own. China and Shanghai is doing it right now. And that'll shut down all industry, so it disrupts the origin of the supply chain. And then finally, we're, the U.S., uh, distribution centers and warehouses have had a heck of a time getting labor uh, to fill their jobs. So all along the way, any, anything that any of us can do to encourage more labor getting into the labor force, and that's happening, wages are going up, uh, the, the excess uh, unemployment benefits that were appropriately created when a third of the economy was shut down, those have all pretty much run out of steam. And so we've got a workforce that's slowly growing, and it needs to grow. Now, at this point, are the supply chain issues directly related to the pandemic, or do you see other factors at play here now as too? Yeah, now it's probably more knock-on impacts, uh, Janet. Early on, it was about the pandemic and impacting the workforce directly. Now those impacts have already been in existence, and the supply chain's bogged down. So it's not yet caught up on, on the labor force necessary, but I think that will occur. And as it occurs, we'll get these supply chains spooled back up. Um, but uh, there's still a little bit of work between here and there. I know at my own company, Union Pacific, we're, we're working those issues and virtually everybody I talk to, whether they're customers or partners in the supply chain, they're all facing the, the same issues. We, we need more labor force to show up for the jobs that we have open. Uh, and we need to get rid of excess inventory and some of the some of the some of the excess assets that are in supply chains bogged down from uh, from from the uh, COVID related uh, uh, impacts. Well, if we're continuing our conversation here again, the phone lines are open, and with that, we have Craig from Iowa on the line with us here this evening. Craig, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Yes, I'd like to thank Dr. Gold to start with. He's been our go-to resource every Monday night for months now. Uh, my wife and I are in our 70s, and uh, my wife had cancer surgery about two years ago. I have a heart history. I've had quad bypass plus a number of stents. We've had uh, our Moderna series, including the booster, all with Moderna, and that uh, ended about six months ago. And we are thinking in terms of getting a double boost with Pfizer, but we're uh, curious to know if we should wait for the combo booster later that you indicated might be teamed with a flu shot, or if we took the Pfizer booster now, it would mess up something uh, later in the fall that we would want to take. Well, thanks for calling, Craig, and thanks for your very kind words. I really appreciate that. It's a pleasure uh, to share updates uh, with our audience uh, uh, at this time. So in answer to your question, uh, there's good science that shows that when you mix and match the vaccines, <clears throat> you get a better effect. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the reason for that is pretty simple, in that although the, the mRNA vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer, are very similar in their mechanism of action. They have a somewhat different uh, mRNA molecule that's used to create protein.
to the spike protein of the uh, coronavirus. As a result of that, you're getting a situation where one plus one equals more than two. So our best advice, my best personal advice to you and your wife is given your age, given the fact that you've got some medical conditions, is always reach out to your healthcare professional first and say, what do you think? What's the best timing of this? <clears throat> but all things being equal, if you are a patient in our medical center, we would strongly recommend to go ahead and get another boost. It may not be your last. We may get into an annual cycle, as we've talked about, particularly when some of these more universal boosters start to become available. But if you've tolerated the Moderna vaccine well, and it sounds like you have, and your wife has, getting either a Moderna or a Pfizer boost at this time would probably be reasonable. But again, when in doubt, reach out to your healthcare professional. They always have the best advice. Pat from Idaho, thank you very much for your question here this evening. Now, Lance, we've talked a lot about the pandemic, but how has, in recent news, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and that war still taking place, how has that affected our economy and the types of things that you guys are, are shipping across the country? Yeah, I want to reiterate what Dr. Gold said right at the outset of the show, and that is uh, our thoughts, our prayers, our energy are all directed at the people of Ukraine and those impacted in the region from uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. They've done nothing uh, to prompt that kind of behavior, and uh, they're suffering just horrific outcomes. Um, so what's going to happen uh, is some significant disruption in uh, commodity flows around the world. Uh, Russia and Ukraine are significant providers of the global supply of potash, which is a big agricultural fertilizer. Uh, they're also a big producer of wheat, uh, and specifically for the region in the upper half of Africa and the Middle East and in parts of Asia. Uh, and those two commodities for sure are going to be disrupted, either through sanction or, in the case of Ukraine, the crop year is probably going to go away w without much of a crop planted. Uh, maybe at best you'd get half a crop out of Ukraine this year uh, and none available in the global markets uh, from the Western world in Russia. So that's going to have a real impact on global uh, food supply. Uh, and we're already starting to see some reactions by countries in terms of putting export controls on their food, <laughs> on their internal food sources. Uh, so that's not good. What it'll do for maybe a lot of your viewers, the, the rural and agrarian economy in the United States, uh, farmers are going to have uh, a really strong opportunity to grow and sell their crops around the globe this year. Uh, I suspect we're going to see that reflected in crop prices as well. It already has to a certain extent. And then there's also going to be impacts on nickel. Uh, Russia is a big nickel provider, uh, as well as uh, 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 palladium, uh, and some other metals, copper to a degree, that go into both old economy, uh, industrial goods, and new economy, electric vehicles. So there's going to be a rise in prices there. We've already seen it, and it could be a shortage of supply there as well. Uh, so th I think the world's in for a pretty rocky road here over the course of certainly the rest of this year, might be uh, the next couple of handful of years, as those supply chains get evened out. And then the last thing that we all know and, and read about is the supply of oil and natural gas coming out of Russia, specifically to feed uh, Europe. Uh, natural gas is going to be uh, a real problem for Europe to try to find replacements. The United States can play a role. So can uh, the Middle East. And then in oil, again, the United States and others can play a role there. But uh, Russia is a significant provider of export oil into the global market. and That's going to have to be replaced. All right. And with that, let's go to our phone lines one more time. And we have Pat from Idaho on the line with us. Pat, why don't you go ahead with your question or comment? Hi, I uh, would like to know your opinion of Novavax vaccine. It's a made, developed in the United States, and I was in the trial and received vaccines in February of 2021. And I have had no uh, symptoms of any type of COVID. And I, I think the longevity and the effectiveness and the safety of side effects are a plus. So I want to get your opinion of this vaccine. 
Sure. Well, thank you for calling, Pat. And of course, thank you for participating in the drug trial uh, for the Novavax product. You know, as our audience may know, the Novavax vaccine and also the Sanofi vaccine are both under considerations by the Food and Drug Administration right now. And they are very different from the Moderna and the Pfizer products. They're very different uh, from the J&J Janssen vaccine as well. The Novavax and the Sanofi products are pure protein vaccines, very traditional types of vaccines. They are mimicked small sections of the protein coat of the coronavirus that we're after. And so because they're so traditional, I think they're going to have a very high acceptance rate, both as a primary vaccine, as you asked about, but also as a boost. And hopefully uh, it will not be terribly much longer before the Food and Drug Administration and the ACIP, uh, the Advisory Council on Immunological Practices, uh, has a chance to look at all of the data on these two vaccines uh, and make a final determination, either for a full FDA approval or for an emergency use authorization. And I am guessing that once that happens, there'll be quite a bit of uh, acceptance. And I'll also just add that we were privileged here to be a very active participant in the Novavax trial as well. And we saw some very similar, very positive efficacy and very, very uh, good safety data uh, in the preliminary trial when that was done, as you point out, just about a year ago. So hopefully there's enough data for the Food and Drug Administration to reach a conclusion, and hopefully we can get these products out on the market uh, sooner than later. And thank you, Pat, and Idaho for that question. Now, we only have a couple minutes left. Lance, any last thoughts that you'd like to share? Well, Janet, I'm just really pleased that I had the opportunity to spend this evening with Dr. Gold and with yourself and your, and your viewing audience. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. And, and uh, yeah, just the last couple of emphasis points. One is, if you're not vaccinated, please give it serious consideration. Uh, my experience is that it is helpful. It's protected my workforce, and I think it's made a big difference there. Two is a little grace and patience for those around us. We uh, talk about that all the time inside of Union Pacific, practicing uh, understanding that everybody's had a little bit of a stink bomb uh, the last couple of years. And uh, a lot of us uh, are, sh are, are a little short in our, in our temper. And, and uh, let's just practice a little patience and grace with each other. We'll get through this. We're capable. Uh, we know what to do. We've got great medical advice and medical health care providers in the form of Dr. Gold and his team and in your community. And uh, we'll be fine. We're just going to have to work through this together. And it's not quite done yet. Grace and patience. Definitely good suggestions there. Dr. Gold, you got a, a quick little wrap that you'd like to do, maybe 30 seconds? Absolutely. Just, of course, to thank Lance for joining us and for all he does for our community and uh, for the nation. Obviously, you've got to keep the trains running without a doubt. But just to remind our audience uh, that we're getting very, very close uh, to the holiday weekend uh, and that a little extra precaution in terms of travel. And of course, as Lance said, let's show a little extra grace. There are so many people that are burnt out. Absolutely. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and, of course, Lance Prince with Union Pacific. Now, if we didn't get your question tonight, you can still leave a voice recording on our hotline. That phone number to call, 855-776-6147. Remember, you can catch Rural Health Matters each Monday evening.